so far we have covered arrays in a pretty good, I would say, uh, coverage, except one topic that is related to arrays, especially in C. In other programming languages, in fact, it's not related much. And the reason is in most other programming languages, especially the ones you have interacted with, they have an inherent type called string. While in C, we don't have an inherent type called string. So this is something we build in our own, right? How do we build? Well, if you think about strings, in fact, strings are nothing other than arrays of characters, right? So you put letters beside each other, they make a string, they make a meaningful word, right? Any word is composed of multiple letters. We know that letters are characters. So if I represent multiple characters together in one data structure, which is an array, I know that this is called a string. Right. There are few subtle differences between arrays of characters and strings, and this is what we are going to cover in this lecture. But generally speaking, strings in C are nothing other than arrays of characters. Good. So we have seen already the type character, so there is no need really to go through it in, in, in more detail. A slide that we have seen before, uh, simply a character which is ironically is also a type that is represented as an int in C, right? That has 8-bit width, right? And things are represented in the format of an ASCII table, right? So the A, for example, has a number, uh, 32, for example, or whatever it is, and every single uh, letter in your keyboard, which whether it's, uh, well, sorry, I shouldn't say letter, every single character in your keyboard, which is can be a letter, uh, uh, a numerical digit, a special character, is represented in this ASCII table, and this is how it's encoded in C. Okay. Great, and this is the ASCII tables. We have seen this before. We have seen character constants. Now comes to strings. So, well, a string constant is you can really write this is similar to other programming languages. If I have double quotes, right, and then write a word or, or something that is composed of multiple characters, this is in C called a string constant. Good, which is basically a, a sequence of characters uh, enclosed into double quotes. Good. So how C under the hood represents this? Well, strings again are represented as arrays of characters, but a special type of an array. Why? Because you need something that tells you you have terminated your array. You have you are done with your word. Correct. So for example, if I'm writing hello or, or two s h four. How do I know that I'm done with my current string? So I need something to terminate. And this is called basically the null character. So you can think of the null character, which is this one. Let's see here if I can use the pen. Which is this one. If you end your array with this character, this is telling the C compiler or in the C language, this is basically the hint that this is not any type of an array. It's in fact a string. Right, and that's the main difference between the string and an array of character. A regular array of character so far. So if I told you define an array of character before the start of this lecture, what you could have done is simply define an array of character, write characters into it. You will never think of the null character. This is still a valid syntax in C, but it does not consider all these elements as one string, just separated uh, entities of characters, right? And this makes few changes in how we code things as we have in, in, in some few examples that are coming forward. But just by adding this null character, you give the C compiler the hint that this is a string, and hence it allows you to operate on it as if it's a string, right? As we will see. So just to apply this rule to the uh, string literals we have, so hello is represented in the memory as an array of character that is composed of, well, if you think of hello, it has five characters, but the string itself will be composed of six characters. And the reason is you have the five characters of the word plus the null character, and they will be stored in the memory in this format, H-E-L-L-O, and then you end it with the null character. Good. Yeah, here, as we say, <laughs> there is a big difference between, well, maybe one step back. Giving this knowledge, we can think of characters also as a special type of strings, right? It's a string that is composed of a single character, right? 
But the big difference again between a normal character and a string that has only one character is again is the null character. If you think of it, I can define a normal character A. And this A is just is going to take how many places in the memory? How many bits? Yeah, eight bits. It's a, just a, a very normal character, right? And it's going to take eight bits in the memory and it's not represented as an array or anything. It's a normal variable. But if I write it like this, now once you have the double quotes, this is a string, which means it's represented in the memory as an array of characters. And how many characters this array will have? What do you think? Two, right? The A itself and the null character. So if you think of how this is being represented in memory, you will have two locations, the A and the null character. Good. So there is a big difference between this and this. Good. So let's 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 uh, capitalize a little bit more on this and see what are some of the differences between character arrays and strings. So here, I have the two represent representations in front of you. The first one is representing well a normal character array. And how did I know? It's a normal character array. I didn't end it with a null character, right? So it's just a very normal array. And then the second one is a string because it's a character array plus one other feature, which is it's ending using a null character. Both of them are character arrays, but only my string one is a string. So this is telling me what? This is telling me if I'm looking into character arrays as the superset. So these are character arrays. Strings is a subset of them, right? So every single string is a character array, but not every character array is a string because you need one additional feature to make it a string, which is ending it with a null character. Good. So now the question is why really I'm saying all of that? Why? What is basically uh, uh, why it matters? Why should I care, right? So you care because there are special uh, C standard libraries that allows you to deal with the strings that don't apply to normal arrays, right? And character arrays, as we have seen here, it's a data type because you can define an array as a character, but there is nothing really inherently called string in C. It's a convention, right? Good. So convention means once you really have this null character, you can do some additional features, but in top of the language, it's similar to the Boolean representation we have discussed before. There is no inherent type called Boolean, but Booleans are representation of ints, zeros, and ones by convention. Good. So let's see with, well, we'll go through the same process we have went through in arrays in, in, in strings, and we see how to do it. So initialization, you initialize it very similar to any other array, right? You can initialize it using this direct initialization between curly brackets, but the main difference again is you end up with a null character. And you can also initialize it, and this is also what makes it a string. You can also initialize it using these double quotes, right? So you, not every single string you should really write into a character by character, but you can initialize it using this. And by doing this, the C compiler will know that this is basically a string and will convert your initialization into this format. Okay. Yeah, and, and that's basically also what we have uh, what we have said before is because every single string needs an additional null character at the end, so the actual size of the string for the low wall is five. But the array size is six because it's five, which are the five words H E L L O plus the null character. Good. And I guess this this is also a, something needed for your lab question, right? I believe it asks you to traverse the the string and and find the size. So well, once we knew this right now, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. How can we traverse a string? Well, now I have the hint. Right, so I know that my string always ends with a null character. So just enough really to have a for loop that goes through from the beginning of the array until I hit 
yeah? The null character, and then you are done, right? For example, if I want to write a program that uh, finds the number of characters in, in a string, how can I get that? Yeah? Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. So I guess I would break it down into two parts. The first bar is can I take a, a normal character array and transform it into a string? The answer is yes, by really terminating it by a null character. But in that case, you need an array size larger than one for, for the original one. Uh, but then comes to the second part, which is a little bit tricky. But what happens if the original character array happened to have the termination character in the middle, right? And we will have a few examples discussing this. So that's also a good point. So here, if I want to loop through the, the string, for example, here I define a string called blue. And then I have a for loop. And then what I want to do is just simply traverse it to do something to count the number of characters or print it, or you can do multiple things by traversal. But the main question here is what should be your termination condition? And we have already said this is now you don't make your termination condition based on number of iterations, unlike traditional arrays, but you make it based on whether you had the null character or not. How to write this down? What, what can I write in that case? Yeah. Not equal, exactly. Like if I say equal, equal, that means this is my, again, we mentioned before that in loops, your condition is your execution condition, not your termination condition, right? Which means you, as far as you are true, you will continue. So as far as your array, which is B in that case, of I does not equal to the null character, you are good. And once you hit the null character, you know that you are done with your string, right? Is that clear? So I have one direct question out of this example. In all the examples we had for arrays, whether it's 1D or 2D or whatever, we needed, when we deal with functions, we needed also to pass the array size, right? Because the Cole function doesn't know what is the size of the array. If you remember the array parameter, you just pass the empty bracket, so you don't put the size there. So we needed an additional input parameter to pass in the array size, such that inside the Cole function, for example, I have a for loop that traverses this array. And you have seen this already in lab two and lab one questions, right? When we have an add the test case that calls a function, one of our questions, we also pass the array size there, or we have it defined as a constant, similar to the transpose example we had, right? We had hash defined n and we used n everywhere. For the string, do we still need that? If I'm writing a function that will process a certain string or operate on it, do I still need to pass the size? No. Yeah, because it's already included in the string itself, right? So now there is a way for the Cooley function to know what is the size of the string by maybe, for example, doing a for loop at the beginning and go through all the elements until you hit your null character, character and you know how many characters you have in your string, right? And it's just simply using it in, in a different way. In the previous example, it was a for loop. And given that we have mentioned this also as the, the difference in the use case between for and while, as we said, it's more intuitive to use a while if you have a condition that does not de depend much on your counter. Here, well, it still depends on the counter because you access BI. Uh, so I would say for and while here are equivalent from, from intuition point of view. Uh, and both are, are definitely functionally correct, right? But to write this in while, well, simply I need to have exactly the same execution condition but I need to increment my counter inside my loop. And this is how you can process a string. Good. Well, great. So continuing this example, we said we are traversing it. If I want to compute the size of a string, what can I do? will be an I, exactly, thank you. So basically you have I as your index here in your traverse, which means by the end of the loop, I in fact will be pointing to, well, the size of your string, which is the last element of your string, right? In the low case, for example, I would be zero in the case of eight, let's see this. 
So I have my hello string here, and I end up with an alt character. At the beginning, I is zero. If I'm traversing my string, so I keep increasing I, so it will be zero, one, two, three, four. So I will be four here. And then in the next time you increment I, right? So it will be five when you reach here. So I is equal to five, but then your termination condition uh, or, or basically execution condition will be false, which means you will not execute it. So you end up at the end of the loop with I equal five. So in that case, five is the number of characters you really have in your in your string, right? Because hello has five elements, right? So here I'm defining another, well, this is basically an, a naive implementation just to separate the size from the counter, but I can just simply use the counter. Size here works as just a very simple counter, right? Just the same thing. So if I want, and maybe this is an example we can code together. So if I want to, well, do more interesting stuff with traversal than just counting the number of characters. For example, if I want to find the number of occurrences of a letter M or M capital, for example, in a certain string, what can I do, right? And maybe one, one piece of motivation or high level context before we jump into hands-on examples is you might not be aware, but in fact, operations on strings uh, are very, very practical use cases of programming nowadays, right? Natural language processing, um, uh, basically scanning text box or doing automatic translations. Like it's it's a field on its own in machine learning, right? How to operate on strings. And many of the examples, well, not just really machine learning, but security as well, because most of your hash codes are also kind of strings, right? And you want to include them in an efficient way. But also in communication systems, right? While you're talking in your phone, well, your voice will be translated into a message, number of packets, you will learn this later on in communications, will be encoded, sent on a channel, right? And then decoded at the other end. If I don't do any processing of my string, well, for example, compression or, or other high quality retrieval techniques at the receiver side, your communication will be as efficient, which means at the end of the day, all of this translates to operating efficiently on strings, either by hashing or by encoding for security purposes, or by information retrieval or error detection. So all of these are string operations. And this is why if you have went through, I don't think maybe by now you have already went through this, but hopefully soon you'll go through some of the interviews and you will find that many of the software internship interviews really also focus on string questions. If you open sites like lead code or, or well, Stack Overflow or, or whatever site for, like that is related to programming, you'll find also people are interested a lot in algorithms operating on strings. If you open a general programming book, you will also find specific chapters operating on strings. And the reason is, as I have told you some examples, the applications are very wide and they are day-to-day -day use, right? So knowing the essence, what we're discussing here are the basics, but without knowing these basics, you cannot really operate on uh, later on on strings, right, in programming. And one thing that I find very good about C is that it's very low level. So, so it doesn't give you basic, it's not like Python. Like Python, I can use all the libraries to operate on strings without really even understanding how they work because you don't implement them yourself, right? Uh, but in C, well, to have a function, you should really operate, like implement it yourself. We have some helper functions, but in the labs you are prevented from using, uh, which means, for example, if you needed a string copy function, you should do it yourself, unless I kind of said you, you, should, you can use it. And the same thing applies in the exam. If, if you required some sort of support for a string copy or string matching or anything, or string size, uh, you should write it on your own unless you are told that you can use some of the C standard library uh, support for strings. So the good thing about C is that you see the low level how things operate, which means it comes natural to you even if later on you abstract and use the built-in functions, you understand how to best use them. Okay. So let's try to code this example. 